when I got in the game industry, I was like, you know, I would really like to make a historical game. Obsidian is kind of known for making very complex mechanical games, games that are focused on story, focused on characters. So I was like, well, if I'm really focusing on telling a story more than mechanics, the weirdest fiction we can come up with in some cases just doesn't hold a candle to the weird stuff that's actually happened in history. Josh picked the setting of 16th century Bavaria because there's a lot of really interesting things that are happening. It really is a story that is ultimately about changing over time with the community around. At the heart of this community, it was very Catholic. You have the tensions between the peasantry and the abbeys. Peasants kind of losing more and more of their rights. And various pressures and challenges in the artistic space. There were technological improvements. The printing press had been invented. That was this transition phase into print from hand-illuminated manuscripts. The printing press suddenly changing the world. More people are becoming educated. That literally changes who we are as people. I thought it'd be interesting to show not only how just the normal course of time and life and death affected the community, but also the things that Andreas, your character, does. Andreas is a secular artist who is working in a scriptorium for the Abbey. One day, a baron comes to town who is a big supporter of the Abbey. He buys a lot of books. This brings a lot of money into the Abbey, so the Abbey likes this man. And then the next day, he's dead. Whoops. His best friend, his mentor, Brother Piero, the murder's pinned on him, and so Andreas is like, I'm gonna find out who really did this. There's not really a trial that you see. You're being asked questions by an archdeacon who's coming and investigating. Religious arguments are used on both sides, and it becomes very complicated. Religion is extremely important in Pentiment because it was extremely important to 16th century European society. The Abbey's rules and beliefs completely shapes the lives of the people who live in this setting. But that's at the time where Martin Luther was starting to sort of fan the flames of what would become the Reformation. And the printing press actually helped facilitate their communication and organization. So there was really a lot of social upheaval that happened at the time, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I find the era really fascinating. The idea to have the game take place over 25 years largely came from my interest in showing how the changes and the choices that the player makes impact the community over longer than the, the typical amount of time that a game takes place in. A 25 year span in one place allows us to really dig into the lives of the people that the player touches. Passing that much time shows us kind of how the world is changing. And make the sort of choice and consequence thing that we're always throwing around when we're talking about narrative games to make that really real. When it came to the art style, it started with the very basic premise of this is going to be a side-scrolling perspective. So with that in mind, I started thinking about something that would feel appropriate for the time period, and many illuminated manuscripts and woodcuts are sort of illustrated from that side view. And I was like, well, maybe we should use this. There is a large book called Chronicles of Nuremberg that is a huge book that had so many woodcuts in it. and was very similar to the time period and place that we were referencing, so how people were designed, how landscapes were designed. There's a charm there. There's something there that allows you to really latch onto it and be like, wow, this is what art was and how art was represented in that time period. The characters who are older, especially at the beginning of the game, they are painted in a style that looks painted. They look like they're illuminated manuscript characters. It's to represent like they're of this time and of this community and social structure. And everyone that's being born in this age of print looks like they were made in the age of print. It looks like they have a color kind of underneath the dark outlines that define them. It's the tone of the paper coming through, it bleeds out. How can we mimic that consistently, especially when you're working digital, you have to sort of manually put all that back in. When it came to the animation, the first thing was to preserve the actual art style. We really tried to emphasize a lot of head movement, so it looks completely 2D, but the heads are actually 3D, especially when it came to the faces, being able to communicate expressions was very important. Because writing and the changing in writing media is part of the story, I thought it would be interesting to use the mechanics of writing to tell a story as well. 
Because there is no voiceover in the game, text is the medium through which the entire story is told. The fonts that we ended up developing, I think, played a big role into giving characters different flavors of voices. When you meet a person, they'll be presented in the font of who Andreas perceives that person to be. He perceives someone as speaking from a certain perspective based on their education or their personality or whatever. But then something happens where that changes and he's like, oh wait. And then the font shifts to better reflect whoever they actually are. When it comes to animating the fonts, that's the big one that no one sees the blood, sweat and tears going into. All of the handwritten scripts actually come in one stroke at a time. There are five stroke fonts in the game, and each character in every glyph has an animated stroke mask. And the reason why we put that amount of effort into it was because we wanted to have each character that we talked to feel like they're writing to us. They're talking to us. Even though the majority of the game is spent exploring and talking to people, we did want there to be other light mechanics spread throughout the game. We wanted things that were immersive and engaging and educational, but not hard, not frustrating. There are certain things that, as we all know, are much better to do and to interact with than they are to tell someone about. We have a broad variety of different mini games that are all sort of not presented to be functionally challenging. It's not to have a game within a game. It's kind of just to supplement the narrative experience. By giving them these really simple mini games that are there for immersion, we break up the flow, we give them some beautiful art, we give them more insight into how the world works. And it kind of keeps the game moving and exciting and different and wondering what the next mini game will be. We have a cookie cutting mini game. It's very simple. You have four shapes and you have a sheet of dough. And you're tasked with using as much of the dough as you possibly can by rotating the cookie cutters and cutting things out optimally. But I've seen many people spend over a half an hour on this cookie cutter game because they just want to get it perfect. We have a couple ways of helping the player find and progress various storylines in Pentiment. The main way is the journal. It's just this really cool evolving thing that feels like something that you, as Andreas, are filling out. It's loaded with characters you meet, it's loaded with glossary terms that you learn so that you can go back and reference this stuff and hopefully not get too confused by our massive world with tons of characters. Because so much of the game takes place outdoors, or in spaces that are more open to the outside world. I wanted natural sounds and time of day and wind and season. Walking through the worlds, you'll hear the birds chirping, you'll hear the wind blowing, you'll hear your character's footsteps, you'll hear all that stuff. And music is more for special occasions that occur in the game. It was also really important to us that this music felt traditional. It felt like it was from the time period. It felt like we were using traditional instruments. We reached out to this group, Alchemy, that uses traditional instruments and makes music like this. They adapt historical pieces into a modern setting, or they'll change the instrumentation or the key. And we said, hey, you guys interested in making a game? And they were like, oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I've always known that it was a niche game, and so I kind of figured that a very small segment of people would be like, cool, I'll check it out. With the Gamescom demo, I was a little nervous, because I'm like, are people going to play this and just be like, I don't, what is this? When we announced the game, I think one of the taglines was an unexpected narrative adventure from Obsidian. And it really is unexpected. The game goes in wild directions. I'm personally excited to see like how people emotionally attach to the story that we're telling. Like, oh man, I felt that moment or I got really attached to this character. Like that's what I love to hear from people's experience. I think there really is a hunger for narrative first games. So I'm very excited that we get to show them what happens in this time period and in this place in particular. But there have been people who just are really, really stoked to see it. Everyone was really happy. We were like, no, I think people are actually going to like this game. And seeing people with just that energy and then come up to us and be like, I can't wait for the full release. It was so heartwarming. <laughs> <laughs>